Okay. So we're going to talk about approximation algorithms. And first I'll give you a quick uh, overview of what we're, we're going to cover. So first of all, we're going to see the classes of approximation algorithms that exist. Then we'll go into a sequence of four approximation algorithms, each of which, again, shows you one part of, of, of an important topic. So what's an approximation algorithm? You usually, you usually have an approximation algorithm when, the original, when you have an objective function that is NP-hard to optimize. So you guys should have you, have you guys been taught what NP-hardness is yet? Barely? OK. So if you have an objective function that is NP-hard to optimize, then there's very little hope to actually obtain the optimal value. So instead, you try and approximate the optimal value. So even though you can't get anywhere, you can't get the optimal, you can say, I'm off from the optimal by twice. So if you're um, maximizing, you say, I'm, almost at mo I'm, o I'm at most twice uh, the minimum. And if you're minimizing, you say, I'm at least half of the, the maximum. For example, if you had a half or a two approximation ratio. So in this case, we're going to look at both. We're going to look at maximization problems and minimization problems and their, um, and, and, and their, uh, their ratios. Oh, where did, the, where did the marker go? Shoot. It was good. So we're going to look at, um, what's funny? You guys are. Oh, OK. So we're going to look at two classes of approximation algorithms. And the two classes are uh, first, greedy algorithms. So this is fair. These are the ones that are really easy to come up with. You just sort of think of the simple thing to do. And then it turns out that it has a good approximation algorithm, uh, approximation ratio. And then second, they're the hardest. It's the convex uh, programming relaxations and reformulations. So that, this is a much larger area that has LPs, um, uh, semi-definite programs, and lots of other, uh, well actually LPs and semi-definite programs are, are largely the ones that, that we look at. Okay? So each of these, you can have maximization, minimization problems, and for, for each you have Usually, it's, it's easy to write down an algorithm. The algorithms are often simple, but then it's very difficult to prove something about the, uh, the approximation guarantee. And that's because, think about it, you have something that's really difficult to compute. You have some NP-hard number that, that is difficult to get, and then you're somehow trying to prove that you're only off by this number that you don't have by a factor of something. So that's why it's difficult to prove things about these. And often, the, the way you get a handle on this MP hard to compute number is uh, so through some very simple means. So we'll, we'll see what I mean by that in a, in a second. So th these are very two large classes of algorithms. And then you can sort of have a 1.5, if you like, of, of combinatorial algorithms that are not, well, actually, this, it probably deserves its own category, three combinatorial algorithms. Basically, you do anything you can here. All algorithms are fair game. I'm just giving you a very basic uh, rundown of the most popular. Okay, so let's just dive into one. So we have an MP, MP hard problem, max cut. Okay, I show you a graph uh, and I ask you to partition the vertices into two sides, the left and the right, such that the edges crossing from left to the right, their weights are maximized. So this is, this is a really hard problem in that it's been open. F it, the approximation ratio keeps getting better and better and better. And it's really easy to get almost there, but then it's really hard to get uh, much further. So let's just define the problem on this side of the board. Max cut, OK? I give you whatever graph. It looks like some giant mess. And then you're supposed to find me some partition that is, let's say, called S. It's a subset of the vertices that then the, the crossing here is maximized. This value, the, the edges that go from one side to the other, you want to maximize this. OK. So that's have to go in just one direction? Or? It's not a directed graph. Oh. This is an undirected graph. Okay. Now, 
Can someone come up with a really simple algorithm for this? You're just trying to cut as many edges as you can, right? So what's the what's Wait, sorry. the plus the problem is to maximize the number of edges crossing the Yes. Do you have no restriction on the, the vertices themselves being balanced? No, no no restriction whatsoever. You're simply trying to find a subset of the vertices so that the edges coming out of those vertices is maximized. So it could take like the vertex of maximum degrees for example. Yeah, you could do that. Sorry, it's it's the number of edges is the objective or the sum of the edges. We're talking about unweighted graphs right now, but uh, the two problems are pretty much the same. So you can you can think of a let's say let's say it's unweighted. Let's say it's unweighted. So yeah, you said you said take the highest degree vertex. So unfortunately, that doesn't work. So you have you, th that actually by it doesn't work. What do I mean? I mean its approximation ratio is log n. So it's un it can be unboundedly a bad an approximation, whereas we can actually do constant approximation ratios. And, and by that I mean, so, so since we're maximizing the, const the approximation ratio, you, you, you want it to be as, as, um, as, as close to 1 as possible. Right? So sorry, it's one, 1 over log n. It, it, goes, it goes down. Okay? So Any other simple algorithms? There's, there's one that is very simple. Think local search. Greedy. No? All right. So the algorithm is, is start with some partition V. Um, so let's say we start with some, sorry, some partition S, whatever it is. S. And then look at a single node. If it it's beneficial to the cut to swap it, do it. And do this until you can't do it anymore. Okay. Very simple algorithm. And this, this is really simple algorithm has approximation ratio 2. So um, when you say... Sorry, I should be really careful with this. A half. <laughs> so when you say that uh, you find a no, you, you, you look at either side and you find a vertex that and then you say, I'm going to move it like over here. Yeah. Then by if only if it increases the cut size by one. Right? By or by more than one. By at least one. Day. So when you do that, um, do you then start over? Or do you, yep. do you observe that yep. you don't have to move, consider the vertices that you previously said you didn't need to move? Or something like this? No, you, you look at everything. Okay. Every time. This is still going to be polynomial. So you go through, you check every single vertex, whether it will help or not. Right, and that, that's going to be a polynomial time check. And you can only increase the objective so much. You can only increase the as many numbers as there are edges. You can only cut all the edges in the world, right? So then sure. you're going to be polynomial runtime in the end. That's a very crude uh, running uh, analysis of uh, running time analysis of this one. So, why does this have approximation ratio two? Okay. So. The key observation is that when the algorithm is done, right, so, so when the algorithm is, is, is done, there can't, and all vertices have more neighbors, more of their neighbors on the other side. Because if they had less neighbors on the other side, you would move them over, and then you had to have a higher cut. Right? So you, all vertices have at least half of their degree being cut. So if half of the degrees are being cut, then half of the edges are being cut. So the size of cut of S, let's call this, uh, this is the output of the greedy algorithm. The cut size of S is at least the number of edges. So this is G, G is a vertex graph V, E. Undirected, unweighted, and this, this, sorry? Is there a half one over the most So then, <laughs> why does this give us a handle on the optimal value? 
the, the optimal value can't possibly be any, any bigger than this. So you also have that, uh, so you also have that this guy is greater than or equal to half of opt. So this is, this is common notation. We call opt the maximum or minimum value that we could possibly attain. And um, usually the connection between opt and something that we can compute is very lame. Okay? It's unfortunately lame. And this is the kind of connection you get. You get just like all vertices in the world could possibly be cut. And somehow the, you find an algorithm that cuts half of all the vertices in the world. Sorry, isn't it? Aren't you going to say that the optimum cut is bigger than the cut on mass? Say again? Can't you just say that the optimum cut is bigger than the cut on mass? Because you're cutting a max cut, so you can, maybe you can cut more than this one. Your, your, your cut value is the amount of edges across the top, right? Yeah. And we're trying to find the biggest one. Yeah. So I found you one of them. Mm -hmm. Maybe the optimum has more, which is great. So shouldn't I be saying that the opt itself is bigger than the cut? So, so it's still, it's one half opt is less You get the same answer, I'm saying. Shouldn't you, be, shouldn't you be if, able if, to say that? I, I think we're saying the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, that's what so, so, so if you, say, if it, if you, if you want to think about it the other way, that's fine. That's basically what the, the argument was, right? The opt could be bigger than the cut. So this is, this is a very simple connection to opt. We have a very simple handle on opt. Sometimes we have a more interesting handle on opt via convex programming or integer programming. Or, and we'll, um, we'll see those examples. This is just to get our feet wet. Very simple example, okay? And you guys haven't seen many randomized algorithms, right? Not in this. So I want to show you a randomized version of this as well. Okay, it's also really, really simple. So instead of running that greedy algorithm, you could run through every single vertex and flip a fair coin. And with probability one included in S, sorry, with probability half included in S, and with probably half don't. So just randomly select which side every vertex goes to. And then the expectation, so then, and then I'm going to define a random variable x that is the size of the cut. And the size of the cut is just, and then is, 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 this, is, is the size of how many edges were cut. And I'm going to have a random variable for every edge indicating whether it was cut or not. Okay? So this is total cut size. And then xi is whether edge i was cut. And these are all indicator random variables except for this guy. This guy counts. Was cut. And if I sum this over all edges, this is the random, x is the random variable that, in, that is the cut size. Right? We'd like to see what the expectation of this random variable is. Well then we just take expectations on both sides and by, by these are indicator random variables, and by linearity of expectation, the, we get um, expectation of xi. Right? Now this is an indicator variable, so its expectation is its probability, and its probability is exactly a half, because it, the two sides are either on the, on the same side, the two ends of the edge are either on the same side with probability half, or they're on different sides with probability half. So you just end up summing this, uh, you just end up summing a half this many times, which is half of, so in expectation, you cut half of the edges. And with high probability, you can show that if you repeat this process enough times, so it, you will actually cut half of the edges, right? So you'll eventually get the expectation of the random variable. Okay? So then, but by the same argument as before, you, you will have found something that cuts half of the total edges in a graph and therefore at least half of opt. But the claim you have to make here is that you're probably approximately correct. Okay, so we're, we're not only now, but, but usually it's not really a problem to be probably approximately correct because whatever you did, you can just repeat it a few times 
and take the best answer. And then with almost guaranteed probability, you found something that is a good approximation to your, to your problem. <coughs> so it's not really an issue that you've added some randomization at all. Although the approximation factor is a much bigger issue. Yeah. So for randomized algorithm, you, you take the x. So how do you define the ratio of the, the, the algorithm? You take the expectation, right? Yeah. So the expectation of uh, the cut size, uh -huh. the expectation of the objective, which is the cut size. And, and then you also, you, the burden is also on you to prove that you'll get the objective with high, we'll, you'll get the expectation of the objective with high probability. And here it's pretty easy to, to show that. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it because we just have to go into some very simple uh, turn off bounds, some concentration inequalities that you'll see next quarter in Professor Papa Nicolaou's class. But, or, well, you want me to go into it? I, I, can, I can do that, but it's, not, it's so, not the best use. So you're saying, the thing you're, you, so you have to, to argue is that you'll meet the expectation? Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about? You'll meet the expectation or go higher, yeah. Right. And, and, or you can show that you'll, 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 go, you'll be below the expectation with very low probability. Sure. And, yeah. I'm not and sure. you'll see that as you repeat the process, the probability of not meeting the expectation goes down exponentially. So you repeat this process five times, the probability that you'll not meet it is like 0.99. Uh, that you will meet it is 0.99. I got it. I got to get the direction for it. It's more. Okay. So that's max cut. Oh, okay, sorry. So the, the comment I meant earlier, next, next uh, review session we'll see the best currently known approximation ratio for this, which is 0.878. This was half, this is point. This comes from the cosine of an angle. So we're going to see next, uh, next session how to get this. What will happen is we'll solve a semi-definite program, and then we'll round the semi-definite program solution to be, the semi-definite will, will, will give us a fractional solution. We'll round it uh, in, in a very clever way such that we'll get a 0.878 um, approximation ratio. And this is the best currently known, and it's conjecture, conjectured that it's the best possible, but not definitively. So. I mean, this is pretty close to optimal, right? 87% on the way to optimal. So, so is there an lower bound? Um, I think it's like 0.94. So there's some, 0.94 is, this is, the, I'm not sure about this number, but it's in the 90s. That you can't do better than that. But then there's still a gap between the two. Sure, of course. And someone's conjectured that the, the gap is actually empty and there's nothing you can put in here. But um, that's, that's out of the scope. So that's the unique games conjecture, and, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. But I am going to talk about how to get this. Next, next lesson, since we don't have the time for this one. OK. So that's max cut. It's actually a very difficult problem. It's one of the more tradi traditional NP-hard optimization problems, and it's been around for s decades. So it's, get, it's gotten a lot of attention. So. The next algorithm we're going to look at is um, the traveling salesman problem. Can, can, can you guys raise your hands if you've ever seen traveling salesman in any form? I just want to get vague intuition. It's not homework. It's homework. Week. Week, so. <laughs> homework. Oh, <laughs> shoot. OK, what's on the homework? I should know. I might be giving you answers. <laughs> Is it the ATSB that's on the homework by any chance? The asymmetric traveling system no, problem? No, it's no. all symmetric. symmetric. Okay. So the, the traveling salesman problem in its own right it's actually, you can't approximate it, okay? So, if, so the traveling salesman problem is defined as such. I give you a, a, an arbitrary graph, undirected at first, okay? We'll turn it directed later, but for now it's undirected. So I give you an arbitrary graph, and it has a bunch of nodes, obviously. It has a lot of edges, and their edges are weighted. Some edges could be missing. 
in the general case. Some edges could be missing. Now, I ask you to find me uh, a path that visits every vertex exactly once and is of minimal, minimum weight. And the sum of a path is obviously the, the edge weights that you uh, encounter across the path. Okay, so this is uh, impossible to even approximate given the current version that I gave you. If there are some edges missing and there are no further restrictions other than directedness, it's impossible to approximate because even finding a feasible solution to this optimization problem is MP hard. Why is that? Is because this, the cycles that you're looking for, cycles that visit all nodes exactly once in a graph that may or may not be complete, is MP hard. Just, just finding a single feasible solution is really difficult. So you're, you're, you already have to make some, some, you have to make your life easier a little bit, somehow. So the way we do that is by making a realistic assumption is that the edge weights satisfy the metric inequality. And this suddenly forces the graph to be complete. Okay? So suddenly we actually have a complete graph. And let's say all the edges that are missing are actually just the metric distances between them. Okay? So if the graph is complete, and the edge weights satisfy triangle inequality, then there's hope. <laughs> and we can start approximating things. Okay? So that's the very first step. So some, again, this is a good example of some MP hard uh, optimization problems that cannot be approximated. And the reason for that is because finding a feasible point itself is a challenge. Let alone optimizing. Okay? So now we've made finding a feasible point uh, possible. Because any ordering of the vertices is uh, a tor that will then go through the vertices once. Like you could just visit in any order, and you're guaranteed that there'll be edges you could take. Right? So at the very least, we have feasible points. Now it's the problem of finding the maximum one. The maximum one. So metric TSP, this is called. And again, even in this case, with this, it's MP hard. So we've added this constraint that it's complete and triangle, but it's still MP hard. So any, any ideas on how to proceed here? So suddenly we have, now I'm asking you guys for, for, for some greedy algorithm, something that strikes you as potentially working. Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's that gives you shortest paths, so right? Modify, basically. Right. So you can use the metric. Yeah. So, so Dijkstra's algorithm is going to give you what? It's going to give you the shortest path from one guy to all people, right? Sure. And that won't be a cycle. It will sure. be. It will be using. Sure. I'm not suggesting you actually just apply that. Well, I'm just we're we're brainstorming. So, what's it? Um, because the first thing comes to mind is that you it's just from wherever you are, you go to the next cheapest, like the cheapest next unvisited node. So then, that's, that's fair. But what happens if I get a cycle then that is smaller than the whole thing? Like if I start here, I then go here, here, and then back here. Suddenly so I have this cycle that's disconnected. Yeah, so are we assuming that the graph is connected? Or, well, the graph is complete. Complete, yeah. Um, yeah, so you can do that. You just don't visit the nodes you've already done that. Right? Just avoid cycles. So hang on. So by complete, um, so I can I can then set it up so that the last thing you have to take is super large, yeah. uh, and then you're and then you have an unbounded approximate. So here we're now minimizing. So the number that you want is uh, as large as possible. So you want to say I'm. I don't know. You still want the number to be as close to one as possible, but the number is going to be larger than one. So here we're going to say we're going to have a two approximation, and that's better than say a three approximation. This is what we're going to, the language will be like, when I say I have a true approximation, it will mean that my value is at most twice the minimum possible. So in that case, I can make it unboundedly larger than the minimum yeah. possible, unfortunately. So this is what you have to deal with. Somehow you have to come up with an algorithm that has a handle on the optimal value and is, and is poly time computable. So what we're going to do, we can use something we've learning class the minimum spanning tree. Right? So if you compute the minimum spanning tree of this graph, it's, the minimum spanning tree itself is guaranteed to have weight less than d 
the optimal torque. Okay, so let's say this is this is let's say this is the optimal torque. It's just like somehow magically given to us on a platter, around, um, around. So da 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 da. da. Okay. Now, if you compute the MST, the minimum spanning tree. Notice that the minimum span the the weight of opt, whatever the tor is, has to be a little larger than the minimum spanning tree. Why is that? Because the optimal tor has a spanning tree in it, right? Uh, a tor is connects everyone, and then if you just remove one edge, you actually have a spanning graph, and therefore the minimum spanning tree must have weight less than it, less than the tor. Now, so you you've got the minimum spanning tree, okay? Let's say it looks like uh, this. Oh, this is not the best. Yeah, I don't have, I guess. I guess I just have to make it larger. Okay. So let's say um, let's say that's the minimum spanning tree. Now, it's not a tor, so I can't just return it as a potential answer to the optimization problem because it's not even a feasible solution. But I do know that it's some of the sum of its weights are cheaper than the optimal. That, that much I know. But I have to fix it. I got to somehow take this and make it into a feasible solution and not add too much weight to it. So I guess every time you add an edge, you create a cycle, right? So at least at first, right? If I pick any edge and try and add it, I create yes. a cycle. You will create a cycle every time you add an edge that's not on the tree. But the problem is that I create... But you want one big cycle. Right, not one big cycle, right? Yeah, you won't create one big cycle. You'll probably create a small little triangle. Right. But maybe so that's you can no use the triangle inequality to like... We do have to use the triangle out. inequality. Yeah. Definitely. It won't be... Yeah. Figure out which edge to add. By the way, the case of TSP in the case of complete graphs but not triangle inequality also MP hard. So you really need the triangle inequality. Okay, so we got to use it somewhere. And so far we haven't used it because the TSP doesn't, the, sorry, the MST doesn't need the triangle inequality. Just order the edges and pick out until you have a connected graph. That's all it does, right? For school's algorithm. So it, what do you do here? You can, you can revisit every edge. That's the trick. So you could, you, let's say we start out at a point and then we map out a traversal of the tree. So we, we start out here and we go around the tree until we return back to where we are. This is like a, we can call it pre-order traversal or whatever. So we start out here, we go here and here, here, here. And then back. So now we've reused edges multiple times. Right? So we took the MST, and we, we have gotten this weird thing that visits edges twice and also visits nodes sometimes more than once. Right? We have to fix that. So how do we fix that? Now the metric inequality comes in. So what did we do so far? We've so far doubled the weight of the MST. So already we're off optimal by twice. Okay? But we're not going to get any worse, because what are we going to do? We're going to shortcut from now on. So every time in this walk that, we've, that we see a vertex we've seen before, um, sorry, every, 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 time we're about, yeah, every time we're about to go to a vertex that we've seen before, we just don't. We go to the next one. And that will be cheaper because there will be a path between the one we skipped to the next one. And we're taking a direct path, so we took a shortcut, so it will be a cheaper thing to do. So what, we would, what would happen here, for example? Well, we'd go here, and then we'd go here, and then we're about to go back, but we won't do that. So we'll just go straight here. And that will be cheaper because instead of uh, adding here and then here, we just went straight there. So we, this is the triangle inequality coming into play right there. Right? The triangle inequality says this edge is cheaper than taking uh, this and then this. So we got, we just made this instead. And then we go here, but then we're about to come back to where we've been before, so we don't do that. 
And then, oh, we're about to come back to where we've been before, and we don't do that, and then we go here instead. So you do this process until you remove all repeat visits to nodes. And what you've done is only made the thing cheaper. You've only made this doubling cheaper than it was before. Yes. So when you go to that, from that top node to the, uh, the second from the bottom, can you just go straight there? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Just checking. And you can because of the triangle inequality. It's a three-leg triangle inequality, but it's still there. And so that's it. You started with the MST, which was cheaper than opt. You doubled its edges, so now you're double optimum. Then you fix the fact that you're visiting vertices and reusing too many, and, and visiting vertices too many times. And you do that by shortcutting, you get no worse there. And so you suddenly end up with a twice optimum. So you can, you can unfortunately stay the same is the problem. Can't you can it. unfortunately stay There's the same. There's instances of this where you're going to not improve at all. By that's right. That's right. You will. You will be. Uh, this approximation ratio for this algorithm is tight. In that, if I give you, yeah, you, you, you don't always provably come down from from the twice uh, optimum. Just the same. Okay. So now this is this gives us a two approximation. Was it clear to everyone? We should ask questions now because I'm going to build on this. I'm going to build on it and give us a 1.5 approximation. So if it's un yes. So we're not deleting any edges. We're just like from. I mean. Don't we need, like, a Hamiltonian not use cycle to do Sorry. it? Don't we need, like, a Hamiltonian cycle to have a TSP solution? Or is this yeah, same? that's what we're going to get in the end. So if I were to, if I never revisit vertices, and I end up coming back to the original, if I only revisit that first ve vertex, yeah. I will have a Hamiltonian cycle. Oh, I see. So, yeah. Okay, now, maybe I wasn't very clear there. So we were here, right? And we, we continue on until we get back to this guy. Yeah. Never revisiting nodes. And only revisiting this guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, and once we once we do that, we'll have a Hamiltonian cycle because we never visited someone more yeah. than once. So then, um, and we visit everybody because this is guaranteed to visit everybody. So now the deletion of edges wasn't clear to me, but now it is. We did. Yeah, we delete double some of the doublings. Yeah. 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 We delete some of the doublings. So now, um, wait, hang on. Uh, I remember, like, when I when I suggested doing the, um, like, just go to the next cheapest and visit edge, um, you said that at the end we might end up with like an, with an edge that's that's really pain to, uh, to traverse. It's too large. Why? Uh, Why is that not going to happen here? Yeah, because the edges that we're only we're taking are all from the minimum spanning tree. Right. So the edges that we're taking are already pretty cheap. So the counterexample that I had in mind to, make, to inflict maximum pain at the end of your greedy algorithm uh, wouldn't work because the minimum spanning tree wouldn't pick that edge. But we don't know, well. Because, and, and so we computed the minimum spanning tree at the beginning. But and then we doubled the edges of the minimum spanning tree. Not all of our edges are in the spanning tree. Sorry? Not all the edges we're using are in the spanning tree. They are. All the edges I'm using are in the, span, are in the minimum spanning tree or they're shortcuts. So they're cheaper than, what's up? That's not quite clear though, because every time when you shortcut, like yeah. if I go from like just the one you drew, that dotted edge uh -huh. would be twice the weight of the two that you scaled. Yeah, but I removed these two sure, instead. Sure, your, your total cost isn't getting any more expensive, but the ex most expensive edge is getting very expensive, right? Like, in fact, it could be linear in the size of the... Yeah, but the, yeah, you're right, sure. Right. But, it, but, but I'm, every time I, add, I increase, every time I add an edge, I remove at least two edges that whose sum makes up for, the, uh, makes up for it. I guess I see that you can, you can prove it. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a little complicated to exact... So, so, so first of all, I didn't show you the counterexample. So I would have to actually write down the counterexample, run through the greedy algorithm, see why it doesn't work, then show you why it doesn't work here. But it's a lot of things to just sort of do on, on the fly. Can you explain the, the two factor within two of optimization sure. again? So what is the size of um, 
what is the size of this uh, output? First, it's going to be at least the size of the MST. Right? And we already know that the MST is less than opt. Is this clear to everyone? Yes. Now, what did we do? We then doubled all the edges. So we have two MST. And then the final solution only took, only removed edges from this doubling Why and replaced them with cheaper. Is this a directed graph? No, it's undirected. Where is the two MST coming from then? Oh, I doubled the edges. So recall when I did the traversing, I go here, here, and then, oh, look, I just reused the same edge in the MST. Right? So. Then the walk you're taking is just doubling every edge. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when I when I do this traversal, okay, so this is the MST. Now I've started here and I'm doing a traversal. The traversal doubles every single edge in the MST because just by construction. It has to leave the node at some point and return to it at some point. And then we make a probably cheaper traversal that yeah. turns into a Hamiltonian cycle for yeah. the solution. Okay, that makes sense. So, yeah. So you're saying you're going to go to a 1.5 approximation. That's going yeah. to avoid this MST entirely. No. It won't avoid the MST. So we'll see. OK, so it looks like any other questions about this version? OK, so let's move on to the 1.5. So should I reuse this now? Yeah, I will. OK. So for the 1.5 approximation, We'll do the MST again, but we're not going to do this traversal anymore. We're not going to double edges. So let's get rid of the doubling. Okay, now back to the original graph. We have the MST, and um, so we have this guarantee, right? And now somehow, somehow we need to get a Hamiltonian cycle out of this without adding too many. So what is the main problem that we solved when we doubled the edges? The main problem that we solved there was that we made every edge have even degree. I'm sorry, every node have even degree. And in a graph that every node has even degree, there exists an Eulerian circuit. Oh, you guys haven't seen Eulerian circuits? Okay. So an Eulerian circuit is. is a. Is a walk that visits all edges. Okay? Can it revisit edges? No. It visits edges exactly once. Okay? And it exists in it. So, so some graphs don't have uh, or, or, or Larian edges, or, or Larian walks. And the characterization for it existing, it's exactly when all nodes have even degree and the graph is connected. Okay? So if all nodes in the graph, so Eulerian Tor exists if and only if all nodes have even degree. Uh, by definition, you might, you will have to. But what if you have only two points and one edge? Then you have Euler. No. Well, you, what, what's the degree of this node? One. And what's one? It's odd. Yeah. You have all nodes have oh, okay. even, then it's odd. Uh, it's like if and only no, if the, the odd nodes the are, are no, no, no. You want a circuit, right? Mm. You, want four, you, want circuit. you do need to come back at the same to the same place. You okay, do need to back. return. There is a requirement that you return to the same place. Okay. Okay. If all nodes have even degree except for two of them have odd degree, then you can start one place and end the other place. Yes. So that's a good point. I'm sorry, I should have been more clear. Okay. So 
you do need to start at the same place. You st sorry, you need to start at the uh, where you end. Okay. And that's possible. Obviously, you need connectedness, but in addition to that, you need if it, if the condition is if and only. So what's the problem with and and that's what we had when we doubled the edges. By definition, we every 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 node would have even um, degree. Please remind me what the difference between a circuit and a tour. Is a circuit the one where it starts and ends in the same place and the tour isn't or something? I'm, I'm using them interchangeably, but you're right, I shouldn't be. Um, I thought a circuit like, was like a cycle, and mm -hmm. a tour was not necessarily a cycle. Maybe yeah, I'm, that's a good point. Maybe well, let's call it circuits. Maybe but book this up. I, it's just a matter of definitions. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't. I forget. So all circuits get towards the other way around. Yeah. But. Or well, it might just be the distinction of whether you end up at the same place or not. Right? Exactly. So let's call it circuits because we are going to end up at the same place that we started. Okay. The, is this clear? Uh, we're talking about it a lot. This should be rock solid because we're going to use it extensively. Okay. So, what's the problem with? And, and just to make it even more clear, is that when we when we doubled the edges, we forced every, every node to have even degree. That was the point of it. So now, we don't need to double every single edge to get that. We can be more clever about getting every edge, every node even degree. How are we going to do that? Well, you can look at the no nodes in the MST that have odd degree and match them up to each other. And find the best possible way you could do this. So you find, and, and notice that in, the, in, in, any, in any optimal Hamiltonian circuit, in a Hamiltonian circuit, there are at least two matchings because you simply alternate uh, giving edges to one matching or the other. Okay? So, so if you have the, the, minimum, the minimum matching in a graph, it's guaranteed to be uh, less than half of optimum. Okay, so minimum matching in the graph is less than half of optimum because the optimal Hamiltonian circuit has two matchings in it, and if you have the optimal matching, um, I guess it's m ma minimal matching. If you have the the best matching, you're un you're going to be less than half of optimum because optimum has two matchings. In it. Okay. Sorry, what is a minimum matching? A minimum matching is okay. I'll, I'm gonna let's define a matching. Okay. I give you a bunch of nodes and I ask you to pair them up using edges that are there in such a way that you minimize the sum of edges used. Okay. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna take the odd degree vertices <coughs> and find the minimum matching between them and just add that into the graph. So finding minimum matchings is, is, is uh, an application of max flow. So, so I hope you guys have seen that. OK, so finding minimum matchings is an application of max flow. And here, we're going to do that. We're going to find, we're going to take the odd degree vertices, which happen to be a lot of them here. This is this one, and then this one. This one, that's it. So, and of course, there are always an even number of odd degree vertices. And um, now we match them up in the best possible way and add the matching into the graph and add, the, add at most half of optimum to the weight of the MST. So now we have every edge, so every node having even degree, and we can do the Eulerian circuit. Uh, we can do the or, the shortcutting again.
and only bring the cost down. So we have 1.5 approximation ratio in the end. That was a lot of things I just said at the end. So this is this is where you should ask questions. So that was that's um, the 1.5 approximation factor. Questions? Uh, what's up? Are they only in the numbers because because the total amount of degree in the graph is, is even. So the even degree nodes, there's the sum of their uh, degrees is an even number. The odd degree nodes, their sum, therefore, also has to add up to an even number. But they have odd degree. The only way you can get a, you got it, right? All right. So there, you always have an even number of odd degree nodes. And so you match, match them up in the best possible way. And the best possible way is guaranteed to have at most half of optimum cost. You put that in there, shortcut again. Shortcut is only going to get make, make things better. So the total cost was the cost of the MST and the cost of the minimum match. That's 1.5. Uh, why is there always an even number of edges in this? In the I, I didn't claim an even number of edges. I claimed an even number of odd degree nodes. An even number of odd degree nodes. And the reason for that, okay. yeah. So, so the reasoning behind that is that there are the total sum of degrees in a graph is even. So, so let's say there are e because um, each edge counts twice. Yes. Okay. So that's what was not Is anyone unclear about this? I'm deciding whether to go over. It or not. Okay. Can you go over again how you found this minimum matching? I know it, you said it was with a as a flow problem. Yeah, that's a long. <laughs> okay. Um. And the claim that it's one half less than one half off. That I can go over again. Could you do that? Yes, absolutely. So look at the ma look at the Hamiltonian circle. This is let's call it, let's say this is opt, and here we say it was around the perimeter, but that's just going to make things complicated. So let's say this is opt, right? How many matchings can I find in opt? Well, I can match I, in part of the matching. I can match these two, match these two, and match these. Two. Right? So this is one matching. Right? And here's another matching. This guy, this guy, this guy. That's another matching. So every Hamiltonian circuit has two matchings in it. Now, if we have the best possible minimum cost matching, it's guaranteed, their, its cost is guaranteed to be less than half of what you find in the optimal circuit. Because the optimal circuit has two matchings in it. That's so what if you end up with two small circles? Then you have to further You end up with two small circles? Uh, you, you see here, maybe you add the edge uh, on the left bottom side and the here? upper. So you're yeah. saying, okay, what if I add this yeah, here, okay. edge and the, the upper one? So you get two sub-circles. You have to further modify it a little well, bit. Well, what do you mean two subcircles? So, so then I do the, I do the shortcutting then. So at first I find a Hamil, uh, I find the Eulerian circuit. Yeah. So that's going to be like uh, da, 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 da. Yes, this right? is not. Now, mm -hmm. this, that revisits this node. So I just shortcut this node. So I start, let's say, here and I go da, 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 da. Oh. That's, that's what I mean. You have to modify it. You do the same. It's the same shortcutting procedure as I said before. It just okay. gracefully handles this this scenario. Yeah. It's just it's just that somehow the scenario seems to have stuck in your mind. Um, uh, quick question. So to actually give out a TSP solution, we need to add one more edge, right? Because no. we were currently constructing a tree, and then we constructed a tree. Yeah. Then we added edges. So we're visiting each node. Then to get back to the original node. And we get back to the original node in an Eulerian circuit. Yeah. And we shortcut on the way. Okay. So we do have a cycle by the time we're done. And we do and it's a Hamiltonian cycle because we never revisited nodes. Cool. Okay. Uh
Um, questions? Last call before I move on to something even more complicated. Asymmetric. We're going to add. Oh, so for the, to find the minimum matching. Um, let's see if. Yeah, to, to, to find the minimum matching, it's you add a source sink. And no, it's going to take a long, long time to actually explain it properly. Uh, any, like Wikipedia has this. So, so minimum matching, you're, you're, you're golden. It's a really well written article. Okay? So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think it's better to finish and, and, and go finish all the way to ATSP before we go to food. Otherwise, we're gonna, I'm going to lose your concentration. Because the next one is difficult, and I don't want pizza battling my, I don't want to be battling your attention with the pizza in your stomach. <laughs> so so let's, let's dive in, okay? So, so we're going to go into asymmetric traveling salesman problem, okay? So metric ATSP. This is, um, so such a hard problem that we don't have any constant approximation ratios for it. There's never the best we have and we won't talk about is log n over log uh, log n. Okay. So this is the best ratio that we have with and and it's terrible. So I'm going to explain this ratio instead. Okay. The log log n denominator has been a very recent uh, thing from Stanford, actually. I mean, Sawberry proved that sometime, I think, three years ago? OK. So here, we can't even, like, MSCs doesn't even make sense anymore. Because suddenly, um, Can you, you review what, a, what it means to say you're asymmetric? Because I don't remember. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So yeah. OK, so let's write all this stuff. That's actually, this is still going to be useful, but um, yes, it's going to be useful, but I don't want it yet. OK, asymmetry just means that the graph is directed. That's all. And so you can still have uh, triangle inequality. It's no big deal. You could just say that, look, if I go from here to here, then it's more expensive than going directly. All right, so this is like a city with one-way streets or traffic. So the It's still complete, right? It is MP hard, yes. No, no, the, the graph is complete. Oh yes, the graph is complete. Yeah, yeah the graph is complete. The graph is, uh, yeah. So, you, so same deal as before, except you just can't do this, um, the, you can't double edges and expect to um, not have a problem. <laughs> So you mean from A to B and B to A, the costs are different? Yeah. Okay. And they could be radically different. So different that they completely cross over. So, when, so if you could find strongly tech components, does that help you? Or no? Because you... Yeah. Uh, no. Not really. I mean, strongly connected components, what are you going to do with them? Well, I guess you can't combine between the components even if you have some great... But a strongly... You can't find... Uh, but, but the, or is it all strongly connected, I guess? So finding the minimum strongly connected component. Uh, so it's saying you find that strongly connected components do something to minimize within each of them and then try to combine them. But I guess that doesn't help at all because there's no natural way of dividing them. Right, it's not, you can't, there is not an easy an analog of the minimum spanning tree. Okay. Yeah. There's such a thing called an arborescence, a minimum spanning arborescence, where you start out at a single node and you find the minimum possible set of paths that go to all other nodes. That's minimum spanning arborescence. But that's not good enough because you can't get back. In an MST, you could. And all you would do is double the weights on your way back. But here, you can't do that. OK. So there's one thing that we can do that 
saves the day. And that's finding minimal cycle covers in a, an asymmetric graph. Okay? So what's a, what's a cycle cover? A cycle cover is a bunch of is a collection of cycles that that every node where every node is at least a part of one cycle. Okay? So the optimal Hamiltonian uh, cycle is, is, a, is a cycle cover because it, it's supposed to touch every node. But the key difference is that the minimum cycle cover can be disconnected. So it's possible that the minimum cycle cover for this graph is to just like go from here and then back, and that's one cycle, and then the rest like just do some cycle around the bottom. That's possible, and that will happen. And that's what screws over the solution because, yeah. So, so, so minimum cycle covers are also an application of, of, of actually, they're, they're, they're an application of, of, of minimum cut. Sorry, uh, minimum matchings. And minimum matching is solved by a max flow. So, so this is a chain of, of poly time algorithms that use each other here, OK? But here's what we have. Our box, our polynomial time box, gives us a minimum cycle cover. The, a, union, a collection of cycles uh, touching each, every node. Okay. But not necessarily connected. The Hamiltonian circuit has to, the Hamiltonian cycle has to be connected. So somehow we have to take that solution and make it connected. So we have what is MCC? Sorry, <coughs> MCC's minimum cycle cover. That's what it stands for. So it's, it's a cover of the vertices, not a cover of cycles. <laughs> yes, it uses cycles to cover vertices. Okay. That's what covers usually mean. You usually name the cover as after what it covers. Sorry, I, what you use to cover. Sure, sure. So, so let's say the minimum cycle cover looks something like this. It's just a bunch of disjoint uh, cycles. And, and each cycle goes around in a particular direction because this is directed. Right? Now, this is no good for us. It's cheaper than opt. Right? It's cheaper than opt, but it's not connected, so we can't return it as a feasible solution. What do we do? We're going to call MCC recursively. How? Well, we'll take a, we're, we're going to try and, every, every cycle must have at least two nodes in it, by the way, right? Because otherwise you can't make a cycle with one node. So you, it's possible that you have one of these guys. Like, let's just go there and come back. But at the very least, every cycle has two nodes in it. So. To connect them up, we're going to use some more cycles. We're going to take a representative node, just pick any node, any node from each cycle, right? and then find the MCC between them and add that in. So suddenly you can get something like, something like this. I would really like to use a different color, but I can't. So let's use um, dashed. Do you have one? Yes. Perfect. So and then let's say this one connected three of them together. Okay. Now we how just how do you choose one vertex you need? Any any vertex will do. Any vertex will do. So now you've just connected at least, so, so these guys, now they're also forced to at least have two in them, two uh, nodes in every cycle. So you've at the very least connected some of these cycles together now. Right? And then you do it one last time. Uh, you say we pick this guy and this guy as a representative of, of, of our connected components. And we go da 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 da. Now every node has exactly even out degree and even in degree. And so you can get an Eulerian circuit out of it, shortcut it, and you win. Okay. Now the question is, how many times, so, and every time you do one of these, every time you 
use, use a cycle cover, minimum cycle cover, to connect some components together, what do you pay? You pay at, at most opt. Because every minimum cycle cover is cheaper than opt. But you might have to do this a lot of times. In the worst case, the only thing we can prove here is that you're having the number of connected components every time you do this. Because in the worst case, you could just get a whole bunch of two cycles. And you have to connect all those together. Every time, you're at best going to have the number of vertices. So you might have to call this recursive procedure log base 2 of n times. n is the number of nodes. And so every time you do it, you're going to pay opt. So the final cost is going to be log base 2 of so Reza, how are you constructing the, uh, the, the TSP? You should... So now, once I have this, right, I, I do the same trick as I did before. I do an Eulerian circuit. So I start out at some node, and I just follow out edges until I return to where I, when, until, I'm, I, I, oh, I until I get an Eulerian circuit. When I have the Eulerian circuit, I do the shortcutting so that I never revisit nodes, and the, the metric inequality is going to save me there, and that I don't add any cost. So I'm not counting anything. I'm not budgeting any, anything for the approximation factor for the shortcutting. I'm not budgeting anything to find the Eulerian circuit. But I do have to budget for the number of minimum cycle covers that I use. So cool, yeah, I understand that. I guess, it, so the question I have is, you could forget about, like just to think about this for a minute, you could forget about half the graph, right? And you could just say, well, I have this other half of the graph, and I could find a traveling salesman solution within it. And then try and take that and merge it back with the. That's what we're doing effectively. But it doesn't seem like you necessarily do that. So, for example, when you were passing out, like tracing out the path you just traced out, you went through the dashed line before coming back to the starting point, right? Which. Like, so if I if I half the graph, right, mm -hmm. and and do what to do to get uh, an optimal circuit? What am I going to do? So I'm asking if that's if that actually works. No, not yeah. easily. I didn't think so. Yeah. Because like, you can't guarantee that you can walk around on the left side and then merge it out, right? Well, you can't guarantee anything about the, the size of how the, the expense that you pay on one side. One side might have all these bad edges, and you're suddenly restricting yourself to those edges. Sure. Yeah. So already the split matters. Yeah. I don't even know how you split. So this is this is ATSP. This is um, and then the log n over log log n is, is much 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 more complicated. But it's actually something that we taught last year. What's up? We still rely on the triangle inequality. Absolutely, the triangle inequality comes in after you have the Eulerian circuit. So in this case, we get the Eulerian circuit. Then the Eulerian circuit is no good. We can't just return it. We have to tr we have to use the triangle inequality to shortcut revisits mm -hmm. out. So is the intuition for this log log n is that you made an arbitrary choice by choosing which vertex? No, the, no. the intuition for log log n is that you're, you're going to sample uh, you're going to sample spanning spanning trees that are slightly cheaper than Man, tree. yeah it, it's there's no intuition that I can give that will help right now. We can talk about but it. It's not related to this algorithm. It is not. I see. Okay. It does not use minimum cycle covers. Okay. But it does use Eulerian circuits, but everything uses Eulerian circuits. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a randomized algorithm that guarantees high probabilities. Yeah, so next time we'll go over the max cut STP and some other relaxations of linear programs and other convex programs. Okay, that's it, that's all. So let's go have pizza. <laughs>